From Guatemala, we enter El Salvador, smallest of the American republics, but in many respects among the most progressive. We're entranced by the beauty of the countryside as we drive along. These perfectly gorgeous flowers growing on big trees again. And the patchwork of small farms, the picturesque grass-roofed houses of the natives. And another thing that wins our heart, paved highway. Imagine that after what we've just been through in Mexico. And Salvador's section of the Pan-American Highway has paved more than 75% of the way from border to border. We roll along that pavement now, entering San Salvador, capital of the Republic. And after a day or two visiting officials, we at last meet young, handsome Dr. Alfonso Rochak, one of the brilliant economists among our neighbors, dealing with the problems of the working classes. Under the doctor's genius and direction, the rural industries of El Salvador have been organized and supported with government money and credit, assuring considerable security and uniform prices to individuals and group workers in Salvador's many hand industries. Cloth weaving, hat weaving, pottery making, novelties production, and the like. All this work is bought at uniform prices from the workers and offered for sale in cooperative credito stores so that the whole enterprise is profitable, self-supporting, and everyone can sell what he produces. Let's visit one of these industries now and see how the people do it. Hat weaving, for example. The big bundles of palm grass or straw are brought into market and the women come and sort it over to buy what they need. Then back at home, they may work individually or they may get together like this, a regular ladies' aid society and talk and chatter between themselves as they work. Children weave as well as the grown-ups. They learn it from the time they sit on their mother's laps, although this youngster doesn't seem much interested in the process just now. Some of the hats are a bit ornate, but you see people wearing them everywhere in El Salvador. The deftness of the women's hands as they work, the concentration in their faces, all of it is extremely interesting to us. From El Salvador, we enter Honduras, and now we begin to understand what Central American bull cart trails are going to be like. We were amply warned before we left Detroit about Honduras, Nicaragua, and Costa Rica. The State Department had instructed our embassies and legations that we were coming, and to assist us in every possible way, within reason. Most of the ambassadors in their letters to us suggested pointedly that we stay home. All said, however, that we'd never complete the trip. No automobile had ever gotten through Honduras and Nicaragua, we were told. And now we begin to understand why. Dust, choking clouds of it, hills, hills so steep and so cut with deep ruts that no car could possibly get up them without tremendous effort. Ruts, those deep sidling ruts that only these high-wheeled carts could get through. And then another thing, unpleasant as it was along the trail, these huge hairy spiders or tarantulas about the size of my hand. We see a great many of them. This one is pretty full of fight. And Kenneth finally kills it with a 22 rifle standing over my shoulder. While in Honduras, we decide to visit what is undoubtedly one of the finest agricultural schools in all the Americas, at Zamorano, about an hour and a half drive out of Tegucigalpa, the capital city. Here in a lush, fertile valley, the school is maintained by the United Fruit Company in cooperation with the Honduran government. Young men from every country in Central America who have passed high tests in scholarship and adaptability are admitted. Board, lodging, and tuition are free, but standards of conduct, learning, and study are rigidly high. Few boys fail to make the grades, however, because they've been carefully selected to begin with. Here they learn the scientific methods of soil conservation, fertilization, cultivation, and production. They use the tools they'll have to use when they go home, hand tools, oxen-powered plows and harrows, not the machine-powered implements which they won't be able to afford when they graduate. It's a practical school doing a fine, creditable job in helping establish the agricultural economy of our neighbor republics. And while they're learning how to make their farms and gardens produce more, they're also learning that such places can be beautiful as well. I've never seen more lovely gardens and flowers like this canna lily field, for instance, than right here at Escuela Agricola Panamericana in Honduras. And it's a real pleasure to be able to show such pictures to our people who have a tendency to underestimate our Latin American neighbors. On the way to Nicaragua, we now drive through miles of country covered by these scrubby peculiar trees in whose hollow limbs and trunks apparently live these long-tailed iguanas. The country seems literally alive with them. You see them waddling across the road, climbing trees, running down holes in the ground. They look awkward and slow till you try to approach, and then they suddenly dart away as if fired by jet propulsion. We try to come close enough to this fellow for a picture, and he runs for this tree, 
slipping from limb to limb with surprising agility. Even with a telephoto lens, I have trouble obtaining a decent shot. I do finally get one, however, when we meet a young man who has captured this fellow with a small rope and is taking it home for eating. We start teasing it by rubbing the spines along its back with a cane. It loses no time in fighting back, trying to strike us with its long, bony tail. As many hundreds of these things as I see, I never lose interest in them. Inside Nicaragua, the bad road and picturesque countryside continues. Friendly natives with big wheeled carts, pigs wearing pokes, one interesting scene after another. Time after time, we're forced up into the bush where we have to cut trees out of the way which blocks our progress. Once in a while, however, nature is kind and bends the tree in exactly the right spot. Along Lake Nicaragua, we try to follow the hard sand of the water's edge, but every quarter of a mile or so, volcanic ribs of rock come up out of the lake and stop us. This forces us across the wide ribbon of soft sand and up into the jungle so we can get around the rocks. The first day, we find ourselves stuck many times. After that, we finally learn the thing to do is to take half an hour and build ourselves a corduroy road, we call it, before we ever drive out onto the sand. So we hunt all the sticks we can find, limbs of trees, branches, poles, stumps, any kind of wood, and lay it across the ruts where we think the wheels of the car will come. When everything is finally in readiness, we give Arnold the high sign. Come on now, give her the gun, we yell at him. Come on, come on, and don't you dare let that thing stop. The car lurches, bangs, slides sideways, roaring like an airplane, and the sticks just fly. But if it rolls through without getting stuck, you can forgive us a bit of boyishness. When finally we enter Costa Rica, our first surprise is to see these trees of yellow golden flowers standing out above the jungles. Across the hills, they appear like huge nuggets of gold in a gray-green setting. Up close, they're as lovely and as delicate as any flowers we've seen. The bloom itself is ribbed and harn-shaped with a deep golden beauty. And then, another bit of foolishness. We need it occasionally to relax. And if this isn't Beauty and the Beast, you think up a title for it. Across the southern section of Costa Rica, we find it utterly impossible to travel by car. Arnold and I take a plane over the mountains toward Panama for 45 minutes to check the trail, and it takes us five days to walk back. We estimate that it would take us four months with 150 men to get our car through, and then it's only a bare chance we'd succeed because the rains have started. So we give up and put our car aboard a banana launch and go down the coast to Panama. While we're guests of the fruit company, we decide to go out into the plantation to see what a banana split looks like in its natural habitat. You know, of course, that bananas grow upside down, so did we, but it still seems curious to see them hanging here that way. Now these fellows proceed to show us how the harvesting is done. The tree is cut about 15 feet above the ground with this long-handled knife while one fellow waits underneath to catch the stem of fruit on his shoulder. With a single knife jab, it is cut free of the tree. Then, off comes the flowering tail. Then, while the one chap carries the fruit off to the loading platform, the other takes a hefty swing or two with his machete, cuts the tree down, and lets it lie there where it falls to rot. In a short time, new stalks start out of the old stump and grow to be banana trees 20 to 30 feet high and produce another stem of fruit all in one season. In this one plantation, there are 26,000 acres of producing trees, furnishing some six million stems of fruit per year for American breakfast tables. You saw them spraying a moment ago, and we're told that they spray this 26,000 acres every 15 days throughout the year. So, since you might wonder if your fruit were poisoned if you saw a little blue spray on it, and it would not be because the spray is not poisonous, this procedure is followed with every stem of fruit coming off that huge plantation. First, it is dipped five times in this barrel of chemical solution to loosen whatever spray might remain on the fruit. Then, it is swung over and dipped eight times more in this barrel of fresh running water, which leaves it absolutely clean. The last time I was down here, I bought a whole stem of fruit the size of this one for 26 cents. Down on the dock at Golfito, this endless chain of men carry the stems of fruit from the padded railway cars over to the loading belt 
which takes them down into the hold of the ship, which will bring them to the United States. And so we finally reach the Panama Canal, the first automobile ever to cover so much of Mexico and Central America on the ground. It has been five months since we left home, and here we haven't even touched South America yet. But we will, for we're headed for Cape Horn. However, reaching the Panama Canal is a tremendous event for us, so we decide to celebrate it in proper fashion. With military permission and a U.S. Army major for escort, we drive out near Gamboa, and there, with the world-famous ditch as a backdrop, Kenneth goes down, dips up a can full of water, brings it back, and with boisterous shouts of laughter, we douse it over the car. As we brush the water from our clothes, we say more solemnly, when we reach Magellan Straits, we'll give it a real christening, but now the job is only half done. So we invite you to get film number two of this trip rugged road to Cape Horn, and continue with us for the last half of our hemisphere adventure and education, this automobile trip down the route of what one day will be the greatest highway in the world, from the United States to Magellan Straits and Cape Horn.